Okay, let's talk about the periodic table. So, the periodic table has a certain fairly recognizable shape for a good reason. Because we've organized these elements not by accident, but very much on purpose in order to give certain information about those elements. So, one of the things we got to be able to do is describe the way it's organized. And so, one of the terms is a period. So, what is a period in a periodic table? The period is the horizontal row that sees them organized with the number going up as you move toward the right. They are labeled A through G. Again, it's the horizontal row. In contrast, there's the group, aka the family. These two things mean the exact same thing. You can call it either one, and it's fine. They're completely interchangeable. But these are the hor sorry, the vertical groupings. And this is actually what I want to focus on right now specifically because the groupings like this are so because they share in common similar chemical properties. That means, like for example, everything in this column of elements will react similarly with similar things to produce similar products that themselves have similar properties. Okay, so that is one of the big things we want to understand here is a chemical group, aka a chemical family, is a vertical grouping on the periodic table that shares similar chemical properties. So let's look at some. Alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals, which is a whole group of vertical groups, and then halogens and noble gases are the primary ones you want to look at for make sure that you, the viewer, understands what their chemical properties are and why we've grouped them together into the same group. So before we get too much into the individual alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals, etc., we need to back out and take a more expansive view of the periodic table, considering that there is on the periodic table um, some major groupings, even bigger than like those families that I mentioned a bit ago. So we can take the entire periodic table and basically divide it into metals and non-metals. And then we can subdivide a little further to include something called metalloids. So first of all, there is a red staircase that separates metals and non-metals. Everything on the left, except for hydrogen, everything on the left is a metal, except for hydrogen. Everything on the right is a non-metal, and that's just that. That said, though, what it's saying here is there's something called a metalloid. Because, see these two metals right here, germanium and antimony, these metals have some non-metallic properties, so we call them a metalloid because they're metals, but they have the properties of the other thing. These, boron, silicon, arsenic, and tellurium, and acetine, are non-metals, but they are non-metals that have some metallic properties. And because of that, because they got properties of the other thing, we say that they're also metalloids. So metalloids can be non-metals or metals, but they are, whatever they are, they've got properties of the other thing. All right, so having mentioned that, let's look at a little more um, in depth the individual properties. Now, um, oh, I forgot about this. Before we do that, of course, one of the things is when we look at metals versus non-metals, there's certain properties that we see. And a lot of these are things people know. Like for example, we all know metal conducts electricity, but there are certain things about metal that we need to describe using academic vocabulary. And let's look at that. So metals conduct heat and electricity, okay, right? Heat and electricity moves through them very well. Hammered into thin sheets. So the fact that you can bend metal without it breaking is called malleability, okay? That's the academic vocabulary. Or ductility, you can stretch it into ever thinner wires without breaking it. Okay, you can't do that with a rock, but you can do it with metal. So that's the word that describes the ability to do that, or the fact that it's shiny, we call that lustrous. And most, certainly not all, but most are solid at 25 degrees Celsius, with like mercury being one exception, or like gallium melts at 30 degrees Celsius. And then there's some others with relatively low melting points, but one gets the idea here. Um, now, the going into more depth now, so I've mentioned that there's all these, this is the general properties of metals. What we're going to look at now is more specifically, what are the groups inside this whole metal side of the periodic table? So one of the groups is on the extreme left of the periodic table. So 
the alkali metals, which is found right here on the far left of the periodic table. These are known, first of all, for all having the same kind of general properties because they're in the same column. And those properties include being extremely reactive. Like if you put any of these in water, you will get an immediate reaction of some kind from fairly mild to quite explosive. This will happen immediately upon contact with water. That is the defining characteristic of the alkali metals and not just water, but all kinds of other chemicals with a wide variety of chemicals. These will violently react. So here's a video showing like fire when you put a piece of pure sodium metal into water because, and it explodes sometimes too because it is so very, very reactive. So that's why it's showing like you keep it stored under extremely non-reactive things like mineral oils in order to prevent it from reacting with the air or reacting with a container or reacting with water in the air or other things like that. So. Uh, that's what this is getting at when it says extremely reactive. It will react with pretty much anything. Now, alkaline earth metals are the second group from the left. So let's go back a sec and there they are, alkaline earth metals, second from the left on a more regular looking periodic table. Here they are from beryllium all the way down to radium. And one of their big defining properties is being a lot less reactive than the alkali metals. So first of all, be careful. Alkali metals was group one. These are alkaline earth metals, so be careful about the similar names and also be sure to call it the full name, alkaline earth, not just alkaline. So alkaline earth metals, also very reactive for that reason you'll never find it pure in nature because pure means like finding a, say, a nugget of it in a stream or something. No, you'll never find a pure something of like magnesium, for example, because it's just too reactive, it reacts over time. Magnesium reacts with water, at least once you set on a fire, you have to set on a fire first, but once it's burning, it will react violently with water, and so throwing water on a magnesium fire just makes it get bigger. Um, so these are also reactive, again though, to emphasize, not as reactive as group one. Transition metals is a whole big group of metals in the middle, much less reactive. So let's go back. Transition metals are this portion of the periodic table. Let's uh, go back even further to here. Okay, this is the transition metals. Much less reactive. Some are found pure in nature. That means like one of the metals that you can find pure in nature is gold is one of the transition metals. You can find nuggets of it pure in nature. Same for silver, same for copper. Um, and some of these other ones will occasionally pop up too, but again, it's because of low reactivity. It means that those atoms will sit around not reacting to make compounds lot that you can still find it pure, even millions of years later. So oh, let's uh, move it on to the next one. So that's mentioning metals. Now for metalloids and semi-metals, like I said earlier, they're either these are metals or nonmetals that have property of the other. So these refer to metals with some nonmetallic properties or nonmetals with some metallic properties. And silicon, as an example, is a nonmetal, but it's a nonmetal that is shiny, aka lustrous, just like a metal, even though it's brittle, which means if you try to bend it, it'll just break. It doesn't have the malleability, it doesn't have the ductility, you can't stretch it out. Oh, and it's not a very good conductor, so not much electrical conductivity. So out of like the four categories, things that make a metal metal, it only matches one of them. That's why I say it's a non-metal with some metallic properties. So non-metals lack those properties of metals, no ductility, no metal, no conduction of electricity, no malleability, um, generally no lustrousness. And there are some exceptions, but for the most part, these are true. So that's how we define it. And that and the thing about nonmetals is that they're quite a diverse group of elements. Like you can find liquids, gases, and brittle solids in the pure forms of any of the nonmetals. And so at room temperature, some are solids, some are liquids, some are gas. So th there you have it for nonmetals. Now, we do need to go more specifically now into some of the groups of nonmetals. And there's, like it says here, there's two I want people to pay close attention to. The halogens is one. It is the second from the far right on the periodic table. So let's back this up a bit. 
There's the halogen, second from right on the periodic table. Starts with fluorine, ends with acetate at the bottom. So the halogens are known for being quite reactive. Maybe not as reactive as the alkali metal, but they are still very reactive. And so some are chlorine's a gas and at room temperature, bromine's a liquid at room temperature, iodine's a solid at room temperature. But they're highly reactive, which means they're also quite poisonous because they'll do really dangerous reactions if you were to like eat it or swallow it or breathe it or whatever. And so that's actually what this animation is showing right here. I'll wait till it starts over. You take a red rose, put it into a jar full of chlorine gas, seal it, let it sit. The chlorine gas reacts with all the molecules inside that rose and it destroys the cells, destroys the molecules that give it its color, which means it loses the red color because again, this is reacting with those molecules and tearing them apart in the process. You pull it out, it is now a yellow rose, a very dead rose that has massive cellular damage due to the reacting with the chlorine. So aside from that, there's another group called the noble gases. And the noble gases are found on the extreme right of the periodic table. Here, starting with helium and going down to radon. Uh, radon, yeah, radon, radon. But anyway, um, what it represents here is, again, it's on the very far right, represents a group that is very unreactive. Unlike the um, halogens, which you could actually, you don't want to breathe these in. Noble gases, you could safely breathe them in. I mean, they're not oxygen, so you'll die from asphyxiation if you breathe it for too long, but you can breathe it in and it won't hurt, um, at least not immediately. So. Not reactive means they will not engage in chemical reactions, at least under normal, out there in the world kind of conditions. In the lab, they have, some have been forced to make reactions and actually produce chemical products, but that's only, only under special laboratory conditions. So normally they're not reactive, so we're gonna call them non-reactive. Only found in nature is pure elements because if it doesn't react with anything, it stays pure, which means pure element. Colorless, odorless gas at room temperature um, you have to get them extremely cold before they condense down to be a liquid or a solid. So that's why these all look the same. They're all colorless gas. All right, so natural states of the elements. So here's the thing. Nature's messy, and most elements have some kind of reactivity. Some are only a little reactive, some are much more reactive. And for that reason, most elements will not be found pure in nature. You will find them in a compound with something else. Like, you don't find pure sodium in nature, but you find sodium in the form of sodium chloride, table salt. There's tons of it in the ocean and other places too. So it's generally combined with other stuff for any given element you look at. But again, there are exceptions, such as the noble metals, which are a few very low reactivity transition metals like gold, silver, and platinum being some examples. Or noble gases, you will generally not find them reacted with anything in nature. They're just pure. And they are in the air. There's not much in the air, but there's small trace amounts of the noble gases in the air. Now, aside from all those things, there is another thing to mention. It's called the diatomic molecule. And diatomic, think about it, like the Greek root word di. Think about what that means, right? The Greek root word di, it means two. So two atoms and then a molecule. So hopefully you all know that a molecule is two or more atoms stuck together. So Want two or more atoms to make a molecule? Yeah, so we're talking a molecule composed of two atoms. So here's the thing. There are certain elements, such as hydrogen or nitrogen or bromine or fluorine or iodine or chlorine or whatnot, where if you have a sample of the pure gas, if you zoom in, you won't see one single atom. You'll see the atoms existing as two bound together. This is a diatomic element. Nitrogen, for example, is incapable of existing as just one nitrogen atom. It's always, when it's a pure element, it's just two nitrogens. Or when oxygen is a pure element, it's two oxygens bound together. Or two nitrogens when it's a pure element, or two bromines, or two fluorines, or whatnot. The way this works is, though, this only applies when it's a pure element. When it's reacted with something else, like for example, chlorine and sodium chloride is NaCl, not NaCl2, because when it's in a compound, it's however many there needs to be for the charge and whatnot, and you'll, you'll go through later on in our notes on how to predict that, or wait, no, actually, maybe you've already done it at this point, it depends on how it's being paced through here. But the idea is this fact that they have to be two only applies when you're looking at the pure element when it's not in a compound. Okay, so 
keeping that in mind, how do you remember these? Because yes, you do need to remember which ones are your diatomic elements. Well, if you put them all in order, in this order, you can make the word Hofbrinkel. And if you remember Hofbrinkel, then you know the elements because Hofbrinkel tells you hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodide, nickel, sorry, nitrogen, and chlorine. And this helps you remember what the diatomic elements are. Because again, these are the elements which, when pure, exist only as molecules of two. All right, so that being what that is, here's some more information about it, tells you what they look like, tells you what their formula is. All right, cool. Now, do this on your own. I will show you really quickly what is intended for it. Um, you look what you're given and then complete the rest. Like, for example, AR is argon. If you look at the periodic table, it's atomic number 18. It is a nonmetal. And it belongs to the noble gas family. And you do the similar sorts of things for the other three of these based on the information you're given, you complete the rest. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so that's how you handle that. Let me erase this out of the way because there's one last little bit to show. Depending on which year you're viewing this, we may or may not have a quiz for you on this. If we do have a quiz, these are the things you can expect to be quizzed on. So now you know what to look at. All right, ladies and gentlemen, happy studies.